Board is present. State Board of Education regular meeting of April 12, 2022 is called to order. Dr. Pritchett, I believe you have a motion. Thank you. Um, each year, NASB, which is the National Association of State Boards of Education, provides an opportunity for um, state boards to um, apply for particular awards. <clears throat> and I would like to make a motion that the Michigan State Board of Education uh, nominate Dr. Cassandra Albrecht for the Distinguished Service Award in recognition of her 16 years of service, not only to this Board of Education and to Michigan's children and educators, but also to her active participation in NASB. As most of you know, I believe uh, Dr. Albrecht will be um, retiring um, this year at the end of this year. So that is my motion. Retiring from the board. Retiring right. from the board, yes. Just a clarification. Yes, so we have thank a motion, you. We have a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Support. We have a support from uh, Dr. Pugh. Motion by Dr. Pritchett, support by Dr. Pugh. Any discussion associated therewith? The board has done these sorts of uh, nominations in the past. Um, hearing no discussion. Excuse me, what's the motion? Yes. Can somebody... Sure, could you please read it again? Sure. I am, the um, motion is to um, apply um, for a, the Distinguished Service Award for Dr. Cassandra Albrecht for her 16 years of service to Michigan children, to the State Board of Education, uh, and her participation uh, in NASB in recognition of her service. Um, so that's the motion. We have a, we have a motion. We have a second. Um, do we uh, have any more discussion? Hearing and seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Pass. Pritchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Pass. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Board. Um, may I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of March 8th, 2022? <clears throat> so moved. We have a, a motion by Mr. McMillan. We have a second by Dr. Pritchett. Do uh, we have any discussion? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Board. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the closed session of March 8, 2022? So moved. Motion by Mr. McMillan. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Dr. Pritchett. Any discussion? Hearing none, if I could have a roll call vote, please. Lipton. Yes. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Pugh. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Strayhorn. Yes. Tilly. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There are individuals. We have one person here in person who wants to provide public comments, and then there are four people who have registered to provide public comment um, virtually. So I will go over the rules. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board, and I will keep track of time. Uh, we will be strictly following the time limits. It's the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and those disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. So the first person for public comment is Kimberly Bailiff. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready, yep, just sit right there and, and provide your comment and you can monitor the time here. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. My name is Kimberly Bailiff and I'm from Rochester Hills, Michigan, um, born and raised in Michigan. And I'm actually really afraid to be here talking to you today. And the reason is because I am putting myself and my family and my children at risk by speaking to, with you here today. I'm at risk of losing my job by having my, my employee, my employer contacted and told that I am a threat. I risk being sent cease and desist orders by lawyers, which are paid for with my own tax dollars. I'm at risk of having the police sent to my house. I risk being 
uh, reported to and investigated by the FBI, and I may have already been reported to and investigated by the FBI um, for being here today because I may have been labeled a domestic terrorist, as a matter of fact, just like the National School Board Association said in its letter to President Biden last fall. Um, at minimum, my presence here and my voice here today will be added to my dossier. Yes, there is a dossier on me and probably dozens of other parents of the Rochester Community School District, where staff members of RCS were paid to compile hundreds of pages of dossier on the personal information of parents who dared to speak up on social media about their frustration with their children not being let back to school starting two years ago. Hundreds of pages of personal information, my name, my address, my phone number, where I work, my email, my children's names, my children's ages, what schools my children attend. And this information was distributed to the school board and the administration, our superintendent and the deputy superintendent before each meeting so everybody would know who these parents were who were upset about the situation. Situation. So you may or may not be familiar with a lawsuit called Denverno versus Rochester Community School District at all. The, the lawsuit was settled and the district, um, I'm sorry, the superintendent and the deputy superintendent, and they were all, they settled because they were found guilty. And let me just tell you, the reason why I am talking to all of you today is because I'm telling you we need and we are asking for your intervention in this situation. When somebody misbehaves at work, you go and you talk to their supervisor, right? Well, guess what? The su superintendent and the deputy superintendent are hired by the Board of Education, but the Board of Education is complicit in all of this dishonest and illegal activity. So what are we supposed to do? And guess why there aren't more parents here? Because they're afraid, bullying, retaliation, reporting us to the FBI because we want what's best for our kids. We, I'm telling you, we need our help. And by the way, the superintendent lied under oath bullying, intimidation, threats, and he is still the superintendent. He refuses to step down. The Board of Education refuses to fire him. Um, they, they all refuse to step down, and I'm here today to tell you that we need help. You, the, the state says that the Michigan Board of Education's duty is to provide leadership and general supervision over all public education. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to the people that have called in to provide virtual public comment. Please admit the first caller. Do we have one here? Hello, please state your name and where you're calling from and provide your three minutes of comments. I will keep a timer and thank you for calling. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I can. <clears throat> Wonderful. My name is Jennifer Marks. I currently have two students in Michigan Public Schools. I just have three quick related comments this afternoon. First, the 10-year strategic plan that's located on the website appears to only contain data through the 2019-20 school year. Where is the current data? If I missed it, I do apologize, but I believe the public needs to see results minimally through the 2021 year as we are now nearing the end of the 21 22 school year. In my opinion, the strategic plan should be a working document, adjusted as necessary with real-time information, not a retrospective analysis. Second, the Board of Education includes in its mission, and I quote, improve public education through recommendations and actions, unquote. If that is truly the role of the board, I'm confused by your lack of interest in protecting Michigan students. A couple of timely examples. Grand Rapids Public Schools recently agreed to lower graduation requirements. I'd like someone, anyone, to explain to me how this improves education or benefits students. In Ann Arbor, despite mountains of medical evidence showing no statistical benefit to masking children in school, but enormous academic and social negatives related to masked classrooms, students are still required to wear masks. I do support local decision-making However, I would expect the State Board of Education to provide recommendations for districts to maintain or improve standards and to refute the clearly detrimental forced masking of kids in schools. Silence from the Board of Education on these issues is deafening. And lastly, 
directly related to misguided COVID policy decisions over the past two years, proficiency in math and reading is abysmal across our state. Please address learning loss and stunted academic growth experienced by learners at all levels, independent of the 10-year strategic plan. While I recognize the importance of long-term goals, Michigan students have immediate needs. Let's start with detailed short-term deadlines, defined actionable items, and measurable objectives directly related to academic instruction. Right now, this should be the primary concern of the State Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Hello, if you could please state your name and where you're calling from and provide your three minutes of comments, we appreciate you calling. Thank you. My name is Renita Bonadies, calling from Midland, Michigan. I was listening to the meeting and I noticed that the discussion involved with um, the schools and the loss of students and then they came back to almost pre-pandemic stages. I was just curious why all of that loss seemed to focus strictly on the pandemic as reasons for the students no longer being in schools, especially the younger ages. I didn't understand where any other issues, like perhaps the fact that topics such as the indoctrination of our students in the state through CRT, DEI, SEL, all seem to be ignored as possible reasons why these parents are pulling their students out of school. It seems to be denial at its finest a strategy of look here and not there. And similar things with the lack of teachers and being able to get people to wanna to go into teaching in the state of Michigan. Again, are we, is it strictly because of wages or does it perhaps have something to do with the fact that people have a moral compass that says they don't want to be responsible for forcing this indoctrination on the students in this state? It seems that we are focusing on one area and not really beginning to look at perhaps some of the underlying issues after sitting through a board meeting last month in Midland and listening to almost 45 minute discussion of why DEI was so wonderful for our district. It was absolutely nauseating to hear how easy it is to get people on these school boards to agree with this indoctrination. And I find it very disturbing that the state level has continued to support this. And I appreciate Tom and Nikki that have been willing to stand up and speak against this. And I just hope that at some point the state gets their priorities right and really begins to focus on the students' education of reading, writing, and arithmetic instead of all of the indoctrination that's going on. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Mike, it looks like all of the callers who have previously registered may have already provided their comments. Am I right about that? Um, yeah, there's nobody else waiting for comments. Thank you. This concludes public comment. Thank you very much uh, to those of you who have shared your thoughts with the board this afternoon. We are going to go to our Great Start Readiness Program presentation uh, now. Uh, this is a presentation uh, by Great Start Readiness Program parents and children in large measure. The impact of the Great Start Readiness Program uh, will be shared through the perspectives of parents and children. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. We welcome our uh, in-person presenters, Dr. Scott Kennischneck, Deputy Superintendent for P20 System and Student Transitions, and Mr. Richard Lauer, Director of Preschool and Out of School Time Learning. We acknowledge, uh, we see in the background, Ms. Pat Sargent, our, uh, our manager um, uh, in preschool and out of school time learning. We appreciate you very, very much. Thank you so much. Uh, behind uh, many a general, um, there is uh, th there are there are uh, 
of sergeants, and there's only one Pat Sergeant. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Presenters, welcome. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and thank you to the Board of Education for allowing Richard and I to spend a little time today talking about GSRP. So we have a presentation that's going to very quickly give an overview of the program. Many of you are aware of it. Um, and we're going to really move into quickly the why of the program and the impact that it has um, on children and parents. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Lauer. Great. So um, just as Dr. K has indicated, um, just a ready set for everyone um, where we are currently with GSRP. Uh, GSRP is funded through the State School Aid Act, um, and we're currently at $418 million with the current expansion that has occurred uh, in a bipartisan way um, with the use of federal ARPA dollars. $121 million has been allocated over the next three years. Um, and that's very exciting to have that bipartisan support of GSRP moving forward. Currently, we serve roughly around 37,000 children um, on an annual basis. With the expansion funds, we're looking to serve up to another 22,000 children by the end of 24, uh, fiscal year 24. So the important piece about GSRP and where we are with that is that quality matters. You've heard me speak about that many times before you. And that is what makes the difference in the outcomes for children, not just having a preschool program. And thankfully, you know, um, with the research, GSRP aligns with it. GSRP leads in areas of research that we do have positive effects on early literacy, early math, as well as well-rounded outcomes for children uh, that sustain through elementary, middle, high school graduation. And so, uh, and the last point here, is that yes, GSRP continues to be one of only uh, four states to meet all 10 quality benchmarks for state-funded preschools as rated by <coughs> the National Institute for Early Education Research at Rutgers. And we will be getting the most recent yearbook ratings out in about two weeks. And so um, I just want to say um, I'm very encouraged by what our ratings will be, so stay tuned on that one <laughs> as well. That gives you a hint. So from this point forward, I'm going to uh, go through a variety of parent uh, testimonials about um, how they have um, feel, how they believe that GSRP has impacted their children, how they themselves have been impacted by the program. Um, by a variety of providers, GSRP funds flow to intermediate school districts. However, most ISDs do not run the program themselves. Um, ISDs are the grantees, but GSP is delivered through private providers, um, which we call community-based organizations, and then LEAs and PSAs. And about 33% of funding, we're sending a report to the legislature right now, this year is 33% uh, of the funding is going to our private provider sector. So we're going to kick off our presentation today with We Discover in Waterford, which is one of our CBOs. And here we go. This school year is the first year our family has been enrolled in the GSRP program. In the short amount of time that we have, our daughter's experience has been amazing. She has shown so much growth, and it's due to the structure and goals that this program has provided to her. We have seen such great progress with her number and letter recognition, her writing skills, her socialization with her classmates and teachers, her etiquette and manners, and her excitement to go back every day. Mm -hmm. The teachers are amazing and communicate so well. As parents of an only child, it is very important to us that we feel informed and involved in our child's education, and they have done such a great job at making sure this has been accomplished. So thank you, Chelsea and Mira of Oakland Schools. The next one we have here, apology for the graininess of the video, but the message speaks itself from Janice in Israel. Good morning, my name is Janice McLaren Littles, and this is my daughter, Israela Littles. Israela started um, graduating in Carver Preschool Program in last year, September 2021. She's four years old. When Israela started, Israela didn't know much. She didn't know the spell name, she didn't know how to read level one book. She didn't know sight words. She only know her ABC, she know the counts and letter sounds. Right now at this point, Israel can say, can read level one book. She can spell her name. She can count to almost 
eight, she can count to eighty. She can. She has been improving tremendously uh, when I tell you, and I'm really, really proud of that, and I appreciate that, and I thank George Washington Carver Academy Preschool Program. Thank you guys. Say thank you, Israel. Thank you, Israel. <laughs> We have Amber speaking about her experience along with Kylie, your daughter. Hi, my name is Amber Burton. I've had two of my children go through the GSRP programs through Sirline Elementary. Both of these experiences have been so extremely helpful for not only my children, but for us as a family. Both of the kids needed a little extra help to get them ready for kindergarten. They both benefited extremely and showed immense improvements in all areas. My son benefited most socially. The program broke him out of his shell and made building relationships easier for him, which then in return made learning come easier and became more fun for him. The program also helped me as a parent. It gave me the tools I needed to help my children at home. They had so many avenues to give me anything and everything that I needed to make sure my kids were on track and ready for kindergarten. Along with all that, I was always checked on to make sure that all of my needs were being met, things such as childcare, food, clothing, and such. This was an amazing program for all of us as a family, and I couldn't be more grateful for it. Thanks. Here again is another one of our CBO partners out of Wayne Risa Blossom Learning Center, and we have uh, Fatima and Yasmin. Hello, my name is Fatima Alloway, and this is Yasmin Alloway. And she currently comes to Blossom uh, Learning Center. She's been doing great since she started. She really didn't know much before, last year, but this year she's doing so well since, since she started at Blossom. She pretty much knows all her letters, numbers, can spell her name, almost her last name. She loves her teachers. She loves, we love everything about this school. Thank you so much. Yasmin, how do you love this school? A lot. <laughs> So here, Mom Rachel speaking about Landon. Hi, my name is Rachel Buza, and I just wanted to share how GSRP has had such a huge impact on my child. The staff there has provided <clears throat> such a fun, welcoming, and safe environment that my son looks forward to going to every day. He is learning his letters, numbers, rhyming words, how to use scissors, all the basics. But on top of that, he loves to tell me about all the hands-on activities that he gets to participate in as well. Uh, simple things like taking in pine cones from an outside and using a magnifying glass to investigate them, making letters out of Twizzlers, bingo dabbing letters, etc. He also loves the extra programs that are included in the GSRP program, like soccer every other week, and the Healthy Kids program, where he gets to try different foods at school and then comes home and demands that we go buy all those foods. <laughs> At the beginning of the year, he was an extremely quiet and shy kid, and now he talks in class, has many friends, and even yells goodbye to them at the top of his lungs at the end of the day. It's like he's a whole new child, and I 100% credit the staff and all of the amazing things that they do in the GSRP program at Warren Woods. So thank you so much. At Patrick Hamilton Elementary, with this um, particular mom, Natasha and Maverick, um, she will be mentioning a program called Strong Beginnings as well as GSRP, just one so there's no confusing. Strong Beginnings is a research pilot pre-K program for three-year-olds that we uh, <coughs> sanction out of a federal research grant that we have. Hello, my name is Natasha Stewart. I am a GSRP mom and once a Strong Beginnings mom. Before the programs, I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, I took care of my son, and my husband and I were really hesitant to put him into any sort of daycare or program like this. Um, but I can honestly say that I am glad we did, um, and our family would not be what it is today if we didn't put him in that program. We have not only seen a change in our son, um, we've seen a change in our family as well. The teachers have helped us bring out our strengths as a family and gave us tools to work on some things that we could do better. Um, we were great parents and I believe that, but now we're truly thriving. Strong Beginnings and the GSRP program have taught us ways to give our child more options. 
let in voices opinion, um, to create that structure and schedule that kids need, and to do the same for other families. Without this program, I would have been hesitant to just send him right to kindergarten, but I can honestly say that he's ready and so are his parents. Both programs have been an essential piece to the growth of our son. He is doing things that we didn't think were even possible. The teachers provide updates weekly, sometimes daily on his progress, as well as share some of the cute things that him and his peers do each day. His imagination runs wild. Um, he is so excited to go to school and see what new things he will learn each day. Both programs have helped our son grow into a strong, vocal, independent young man who is kind to his peers and sees the strengths in each of them. Before I had my son, everyone always said that it takes a village. They were right, and the strong beginnings in GSRP program have been the foundation in that village. I encourage parents with little ones to take advantage of the program and will continue to advocate for both programs, as I believe they were an essential piece of not only my son's growth, but our growth as a family. Thank you. Here we have Mom Aisha speaking about kids experience. Hello, I think that the GSRP program is a wonderful program to enroll your child into. The program has definitely helped my son with his fine motor skills as well as his speech. I think the staff as well as the teachers are very friendly and everyone there is very focused on getting your child ready for the next school year. Every day my son goes to school and he absolutely loves it and he cannot wait to go back the next day. I would definitely encourage others to sign up for the program. <clears throat> Going back to McComb ISD here, we have uh, Mom Holly speaking about Madison. Um, My daughter Madison was in the GSRP um, program this year for 2021 and 2022. Um, overall, Madison has had the most amazing year with her teachers. I think one of the most exceptional things about the GSRP program is that it, outside of a, a standard preschool environment, it offers so much more engagement, um, a lot of touch points. They really do their due diligence to make sure that the kids are steadily on track to be ready for, for kindergarten. Um, Additionally, I think that the diversity in class and the topics that they discuss and the communication from the teachers really, really provides the parents um, a very clean and clear pathway for the kids. Um, they're not just learning their ABC, they're learning about colors and clothes. And when we talk about clothing, how to wash them, how do we take care of them, how are they made? Uh, it goes so much beyond what you would expect preschool to be teaching all while making it so easy and carefree for the parents to, you know, not feel like they are shelling out time, energy, money to, to give their kids an education to go into kindergarten feeling prepared and included. Um, you know, the, the GSRP teachers, they are exceptional human beings. They have the most patience, but encourage um, corrected actions with the children. They encourage kids to solve problems themselves. Um, I think if I was to tell a parent whether or not they should consider putting their kid in a GSRC class, I would say a million times do it. It is worth every second, every piece of paper that you have to fill out, every home visit, every interview. This environment is so welcoming, inclusive, and educational. Uh, it truly is an incredible program that the state offers our families and our community. Um, honestly, I, I don't think that I could possibly imagine my youngest going into without going into the GSRP program in a couple of years. Um, overall, if you're thinking about it, <laughs> don't think twice. The program is incredible. They follow through on what they say they're going to do. The kids get balanced breakfast and lunch and snacks and engagement and exercise and education. So um, overall, I couldn't be happier with the program and the fact that uh, my daughter had the opportunity to participate. We have here mom, Asusana, uh, speaking about Ava and Kent ISD. Hi, um, my name is Asusana Cervantes. I'm 
Cervantes, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how important the program, the program GSRP has been to me and my daughter. It is a preschool program that she attends, and I am. It has taught her how to write her name. It has ta taught her how to learn to share, and it has taught her how to um, learn her colors. And lastly, it has really helped her prepare for kindergarten, and I'm very happy with the program. We have Kaylee here um, speaking about Ryan's experience. And it's back in uh, We Discover here in Waterford. So what has GSRP meant to me and my family? Um, everybody deserves a Miss Peta and a Miss Jenkins in their life. Uh, my Ryan would not be where he is and he would not have hit his milestones if it was not for the GSRP program and for Miss Jenkins and Miss Peta. There are no words to accurately describe how grateful we are for them. And I'm just really thankful that we have two teachers who really go above and beyond and just care so much about him and his education and who really just love my kid and who care about his education, whether that's his writing, his shapes, um, teaching empathy and compassion. It makes you feel good when you can send your kid to a program every day and know that they're gonna be taken care of. So that's what the GSRP program means for me and my family. So before we get into this next uh, video um, with Danielle, <clears throat> I just wanna take a moment, uh, I won't take very long here, um, to read a, a, a message here from the lead teacher, Teresa Edwards at Sam Adams Elementary School about this situation. Um, our classroom is a school family. We teach the children that we all work together and help each other out. This also includes when children are having a hard time emotionally with things going on at home. We have a child in GSRP, Cameron, Danielle's son, whose mom, Danielle, is a single military mom. She had to be away for the whole month of March, this past month. She is at a senior leadership course at Fort Knox, Kentucky. She explained it as to us, anytime you need to compete for a promotion in the military, you have to go to leadership courses. With mom being away, Cameron was having a hard time. To help him through this time, we laminate a picture of her and her two children for him to carry around. That's the picture on the left there. He took it to, the, uh, to most of the activities throughout the day. He also used our safe space within the classroom as a place to take time alone. And we would join him to talk about what he was feeling. Mom said that she was also having a hard time as this was her first time away from the children for so long. She had mentioned that she always looked forward to Fridays when she would receive our weekly updates on his growth, development, and well-being. So we began sending videos of Cameron doing different activities and telling her good morning. She then started sending him videos every morning saying good morning, including the others in her military leadership class. We then, had, uh, we then as a class, added a countdown on the calendar to help Cameron know the day was coming when she would return home. Many of the children would notice when Cameron was having a hard time and would go with him to count how many days he had left before she would return. The whole class started sending videos back and forth with mom. We also sent mom videos of him counting the days down to her return. We not only noticed him having better days after the videos were begun, but she mentioned that it was also helping her as well. I was able to contact or to catch her older child in the elementary school, who is also a past GSRP student in the halls and send mom a video from her as well, with a return one from mom. Now that the students in our class have gone to enjoy these videos, mom is back home. We have asked mom to come in and visit in full uniform to talk with us in person. Uh, GSRP has made a tremendous difference in this family's life. My name is Danielle Phillips. I've had two kids in the great part writing this program. As a military mom, I'm not able to give my kids as much one-on-one -on -one time as what I would like. 
was a great start program. They really helped me with this and have helped to prepare my kids to get ready for kindergarten. So just as a demonstration of the morning routine, here is. Good morning, Cameron. Good morning, Good morning Cameron. Cameron. Good morning. Just to prove that it happened. Good morning. Everybody help him. Good morning. That was their daily routine. Mm. So with that, I just want to say thank you on behalf of my team. Um, and uh, in the handout, you have a variety of other, of other written testimonials um, from a variety of other parents across the ISDs that were not video in nature that you can continue to read on your own. But my team, Dr. Rice, acknowledged Pat Sargent, my GSP manager, there's a whole team behind us that support the families and children of this great state of Michigan, the GSRP. But I want to thank you as a board for supporting us in our work. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lauer, uh, Dr. Kenny uh, Ms. Sargent, uh, GSRP team. Any uh, questions or comments from board members? Questions or comments from board members? Uh, hearing and seeing, uh, is that a, is that a, is that Well, a yeah, I mean, I think it was an awesome presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, very, very, uh, you know, I get pulled on the heartstrings, obviously. Yeah. Good job. Mission accomplished. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Other board members? Any other board members? Okay. All right. Hearing none. Thank you so much. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Portion of the uh, board meeting is the report of the state superintendent. Um, for tomorrow, the Michigan Department of Education begins its hosting of a webinar series in collaboration with higher education institutions, cultural centers, and the 12 federally recognized tribes of Michigan that form the Confederation of Michigan Tribal Education Departments to assist Michigan educators with the teaching of comprehensive history. This series begins with sessions on Holocaust education entitled Remembering the Holocaust, Never Forget to Never Repeat, which will take place each of the next three Wednesdays and will conclude on April 27th, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Additionally, educators may sign up for a June 29th webinar on Indigenous Peoples History entitled Mondongunan, a gathering or sharing of information using the Indigenous Developed Social Studies Guide to Teach to and About First Peoples. Our children deserve to learn the full breadth of U.S. and world history. As educators, we have the responsibility to teach them this full breadth of history, including about race, racism, xenophobia, sexism, and other difficult and challenging subjects. Our children are diverse and we are preparing them for a diverse world. It is important that they learn about the breadth of our history, their history, and not simply a distilled, abbreviated, or otherwise truncated version of history. This webinar series will help educators learn more about historical movements, events, and peoples that are part of the rich, diverse history of our country and world. In expanding the knowledge of teachers, we hope to expand the knowledge children. Additional webinar series on the civil rights movement and Asian immigration and citizenship, among others, will take place in the coming year. This webinar series has the support of a growing number of education organizations, Michigan Council for Social Studies, Michigan Council for History Education, Michigan Education Association, AFT Michigan, Michigan Association for Media and Education, Library of Michigan, the Michigan Academic Library Association, and the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators, the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators, the, Mich the Middle Cities Education Association, Michigan Association of Elementary and Middle School Principals Association, 
and the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. More engaging history lessons mean more reading, better reading, and more learning. We are excited about this initiative and look forward to sharing more in the coming year. And I appreciate the uh, implicit and one could argue the explicit head bobs of our uh, two teachers of the year in the, uh, in the room, Ms. Porter and Ms. Haynes. On a very different issue, last month Congress did not extend the United States Department of Agriculture waiver authority for the child nutrition programs in the country. This lack of extension means that after June 30th, 2022, USDA will no longer have authority to provide the higher meal reimbursement rates, allow all schools to serve meals to all students, or extend the broad regulatory flexibility these programs have relied on for the last two years. These programs have allowed school districts to provide meals to students when schools were closed for in-person learning, expanded program eligibility to more children and families affected by COVID-19, and eliminated certain requirements so that schools could be more innovative in their delivery of services to meet the needs of the families in our Michigan communities. In Michigan, this change would mean that fewer children will have access to meals in schools, meals that help assure that children are well-fed and ready to learn, a key strategy that supports goal three of Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan to improve the health, safety, and wellness of all learners. In addition, schools will face additional bureaucratic challenges to providing meals to eligible students while still working to address the needs of children coming out of the global pandemic. This summer alone, we estimate over 20% of our summer food service sponsors will not qualify to provide meals, which would leave approximately 100,000 Michigan children without access to meals beginning in June. While things are looking promising related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the school food supply chain and staffing shortages have not yet recovered, and schools desperately need more time to respond. MDE's Office of Health and Nutrition Services Director, Dr. Diane Golzinski, and her counterparts in states across the country have been actively advocating for an extension of flexibility for the USDA's regulatory authority. The bipartisan Kids Not Red Tape Act of 2022 introduced by U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow and U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski would extend USDA school meal flexibilities from June 30th, 2022 to September 30th, 2023, which would give schools and families time to adjust to the changes as schools return to more normal operations. Dr. Golzinski and Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations Kyle Garant have been working closely with staff and Senator Stabenow's office on this effort. We're thankful for the Senator's leadership and are hopeful that our collective efforts are successful. Teacher recruitment and retention proposals that the governor has recommended in her executive budget, which were briefly referred to earlier today, many of which were developed in this department, will have a substantial and direct impact on teacher staffing challenges in Michigan. The legislature has been slow to act on the teacher shortage. It needs to take swift action on these executive recommendation proposals, as well as the proposals developed by the department to remove regulatory barriers to teacher reciprocal licensure across states, or its delay, that is to say the delay of the legislature, will mean that the teacher shortage will continue unaddressed in the coming year. And finally, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the historic confirmation vote of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, now Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. It has been a long time coming. Thank you. And now we move to uh, the report of the Teachers of the Year. Ms. Leah Porter is the 2021-2022 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Ms. Porter is a third grade teacher at Wilcox Elementary School and Holt Public Schools. Ms. Porter is joined by Ms. Sheldora Haynes. 
Region 4 Teacher of the Year. Ms. Haynes is a third grade teacher at Martin G. Atkins Elementary School and Bridgeport Spalding Community Schools. We welcome Ms. Porter and Ms. Haynes to present their report. Uh, Teachers of the Year, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Rice already introduced both of us, but I just want to share today that Ms. Sheldora Haynes, fellow third grade teacher, is here with me. I'm very excited for her to share a little bit about herself before we jump into our presentation. So just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to take my mask down, but just a little bit. So the slide that you see is not crowded. It's full. Okay. So um, these are all of the things that I think make me, me along the left side, the corner, my girls, my sisters, my cousin, um, down across the bottom is um, school. And that's, that's a part, a big part of my heart. And Girls on the Run, we love after school uh, programs and running the 5K at the end of the season. And then bringing in just above that, uh, speakers and presenters to our classroom. And then just above that is um, my church and my fam or my church family, a another part of my heart. And then to the going to the right just a little more, that's me and my uh, as a part of the community policing um, program sponsored by the community that I live in. They put the call out, hey, do you want to be a yeah, I want to be a part of that. And so yeah. <laughs> And then to the a little further to the right, donate blood on a regular basis. Um, then a little further, more to the right, um, a lot of student engagement um, out of the classroom, in the hallways, in the vestibule. Like the whole building is our classroom. And so the cafeteria when it's not being used for food, all of that. And then um, I've been at Martin G. Atkins for about five years. Um, teaching third grade, and then before that, it was four years in PBIS, um, middle school math for six years, um, before that, a mix of kindergarten through fifth grade for about six years, um, and I, I am a part of the dissolved the Univista School District, which makes my practice even more trauma-informed, so I, I make it my business to understand how kids, um, student scholars uh, come to us and it being our job or my job to make sure they're seen and heard. That's me. Oh, oh wow. All right. <laughs> I don't want to follow that, Shadora. <laughs> So as you know, um, Sheldora and I are both uh, third grade teachers, and so what we want to do today is kind of provide some snapshots and perspectives from three different, or sorry, two different third grade classrooms. We do have a third third grade teacher on the regional teachers group, Mr. Brian Paul, but we're going to be providing some perspectives um, of the third grade classroom coming into this school year and leading before and our future kind of next steps for those students. So I'm going to get that started. And I know that um, we've talked, I've talked several times about my district, which is Holt Public Schools. But just to give a snapshot to everybody, um, Holt Public Schools is in Ingham County. It is right south here of Lansing. Um, we service students in the village of Diamond Dale. We're part of Delhi Township, Windsor Township, a little bit of Delta Township. And we have students that are coming from the city of Lansing. Our district is um, consistent of 11 buildings with one early childhood school, five elementary schools, one of which is the school I teach at, Wilcox Elementary. We currently have two middle schools and one high school separated between two buildings with a 9-11 building, and then the senior campus that we service. That is currently what we are doing. And right now, our student population is about 5,250 students. Just to give some perspective, though, as we're talking a little bit um, as I'm going through this, um, Holt has gone through a lot of changes over the last 20 years, specifically demographically for students, um, where now, as I've mentioned before at the board table, that we mirror the um, state population of students, which is we have about 40% of students that are students of color, and that has grown exponentially over the last 20 years. So that has been a lot of work that we have been mitigating to help support the needs of our students in a district that is predominantly staffed by white teachers. So I just have to give a little shout out. That's my son there, uh, remote learning. He is in third grade with me this year at Wilcox Elementary. So he did his second grade year at home. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that experience for those particular students who are now third graders. Um, 
I just love this picture. My uh, <laughs> his second grade teacher, Mrs. Cobb, would do pajama read-ins once a week during the entire time we were remote. So kids would get on at night in their pajamas and get to read stories with their class. And she did it for the entire second grade. So I just absolutely love that picture. But um, what happened is, is of course, we all had to do those sweeping changes when everything shut down in the pandemic. And I've spoken a lot about that for teachers. But I'm going to specifically talk about the 2021 year. Um, our students in Holt Public Schools were remote from March of 20 to um, about March 15th of 2021. Um, so we had a majority of that year remote, and uh, we, all of the teachers at the elementary buildings provided all instruction. We did not have any sort of uh, remote curriculum that we were doing. All of our instruction was done by teachers for ELA, math, science, social studies, and all the rest, along with um, establishing routines of support for kids. A lot of that was done cohesively with their teams of teachers in order to make that possible. But the connections that uh, teachers were really working towards helping students um, learn from home was just exponential. And getting to be the viewer of that as a parent um, with these kids then coming into my classroom this year was just amazing. The biggest pieces, of course, that we um, struggled with while children were remote, um, of course, um, some of the academics were difficult because students had different learning environments in which they were in every day, and then helping to still provide students with social experiences and helping with those behavior supports for kids that needed them at home when learning was challenging or families were having difficulties with their students at home. And so we really had to think outside the box on how we were helping to support all those pieces. When um, we did come back and return in person, um, this particular cohort of kids that are in third grade now, we had just about 49% of them returned back to school. The rest of them were still at home for the remainder of the year. So the uh, teachers were teaching both in person and remote simultaneously, along with providing all the remote supports that they had been doing. We had shortened days for those last three months of the school year. So the kids were only there until 1230. And then they had asynchronous learning that was provided by both their classroom teacher and their specials teachers during that time. So um, that was kind of that structure of what it looked like. So all the students that were then coming into our third grade classrooms at Wilcox and across Holt um, did not all come back to school until August of 2021. So when we brought students back, we were in a midst of a lot of transition. Third grade, you know, coming into this as a brand new teacher myself in third grade, I feel like this has been kind of an exponential learning experience for myself. But knowing that this is um, thinking about the impacts of the pandemic, that this is a very um, vulnerable group of students. And I would say any of the students that were in those early grades, we, can, we know that all students have losses of different ways, um, both socially, emotionally, um, behaviorally, academically, depending on the child. But thinking about students that lost portions of their primary experiences, specifically in behavior and social development, um, have been very interesting to navigate. So um, a lot of the work that we were trying to balance was um, keeping up with the content standards, the rigor that third grade brings as we're kind of transitioning kids from that primary structure to a more rigorous academic one. But knowing that students had a wide variety of needs beyond anything we'd ever experienced before. And so, so much of that work has been very challenging in how to balance both. And some of that was and this was where my expertise came in play a little bit. I was able to kind of guide my third grade teachers down a little bit about how to help support, especially some of those social needs as students were really coming back in if they had not had much interaction with their peers during the pandemic as they were when they left in first grade. And so those pieces were definitely challenging in terms of being able to help support the more rigorous academic structures. Of course, you know third grade as well is the grade where we start doing standardized testing with the MSTEP. And so we were really trying to figure out how do we balance the needs, these vast needs, both social, behavioral, emotional, the academic needs across the board, and still maintaining the curriculum in which we needed to face. And all of that rebuilding is still coming. I think it's going to be years um, of seeing how that all plays out. But um, as I have always seen and I'm amazed about not only my own school, but what you're going to hear from Michelle Dora is teachers are just incredible people and in how they break down things and work with kids. And um, that autonomy and flexibility that we so need right now um, would just continue to be crucial in helping kids transition for years to come out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we're not quite done with this year. We're on the on, we're our building starting next week in the MSTEP. We're all just taking a deep breath and knowing that 
kids have grown exponentially in ways um, that might not always show on a standardized mm -hmm. test, but coming off of a pandemic year, I know that um, we are feeling proud of the work that we have done. So as we're thinking about what's next and thinking about particularly those third graders, you know, one of my major concerns is, um, and some of the role I have done this year in my building specifically with my third grade team, is I provided a lot of um, specialized reading supports for students in across the grade level that have needed extra care beyond what the teacher can provide every day. And I've done push-in supports as well with all three of my third grade teachers, including my co-teacher, to help support those students. Um, one of the biggest pieces that we're still navigating and the questions are becoming of what are situations where academics are just needing more growth time and what situations are students that are needing to be provided with special education supports. I think that we're going to see some ramifications of that for some time as we're continually navigating what is our new normal, what is our new structures coming out of the pandemic. Our district is in a lot of transition right now anyway. Um, we have been building in restorative practices, uh, conscious discipline. We've been doing a lot of work on that behavior end and that social emotional end. And I think that that's going to take some time to establish, but having the intentionality of that I think will be critical as students are continuing to go grade to grade and transition um, from the years that we were um, not in the more structured normal school setting. We are also um, really looking at our curriculum to make sure that we are um, focusing in on the standards and how we can provide more equitable experiences for students and um, building units by design, working collaboratively as grade level teams and um, looking at um, the most appropriate um, uses of curriculum and how we are really utilizing those to help all students uh, gain success and have self-worth and be able to um, you know, navigate their learning and build that independence. And um, as well as um, our district had adopted our inequity oriented strategic plan that is also in play with all of this as well, along with a bond that is restructuring all of our buildings so we have less transitions for students to help with that social emotional behavioral piece. So all that being said, our third graders right now in Holt have a lot of transitioning going on as is I think we all feel on our daily basis, but um, knowing that we have uh, teachers around us that are willing to put in the work and help to provide the supports, um, I, I feel that we are coming to you know, a place where we're going to start seeing some real growth and success um, with what we are providing and hopefully more that we will be able to provide um, with some of the desperately needed reliefs that buildings need. Now with that, I'm going to have Shildora share, and I went way longer than I told you. No, I that's would. okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. And so, in uh, stark contrast to what Leah is dealing with in Holt, Bridgeport is about 25 miles in diameter from one side of the circle to the other side of the circle, and it's combined like rural, urban, and suburban. And so, if this is the city of Saginaw in the middle, Bridgeport, Frankenmuth. Um, what was Buena Vista, Saginaw Township, Freeland. So we're on the outskirts. And we only have three buildings and about 1,500 students, uh, about 642. So our biggest concentration of students is in our K-5 area. Um, and then about 86 third graders. Uh, and we've been 100% free uh, breakfast and lunch for about five, about five years. Um, our <laughs> sweeping changes, um, our sweeping changes like Leah discussed, but ours are just a little different. In 20, uh, 20, 2021, uh, we had the offering of virtual or face-to-face -face learning. Um, we had about 75% of our students were present for in-person learning and our school day ended at 1.30. Uh, like many districts, uh, not like Leah's, <laughs> but we, we purchased a remote learning program that was supposed to meet the needs of all learners through distance learning. Mm, we don't know that that actually happened. Um, it, our superintendent would say, um, we're building the plane as we were flying. Uh -huh. um, being in the face of that immediate, we got to have something, this is what we got. Without adding more pressure 
on the teachers that were already feeling stressed um, without having anything to do. We had another plan. That, that plan didn't work. So um, we had PD training in synchronous and asynchronous learning um, in Zoom, delivering and conducting assessments through distance learning, which was another um, sweeping change. I've never given the NWEA uh, virtually before, so somebody had to come and show me or tell me that, mm -hmm. hey, this is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. um, communication protocols were put in place to make sure students were accounted for and family needs were being met, like um, our friends in the GSRP program. Uh, we also went out and made sure that students um, had food. I mean, if they were coming to us, mm -hmm. we could make sure that that was happening, but not everybody was coming to us. So we had to make sure that students were getting fed and students were seeing an adult and, and parents knew that we weren't just leaving you out on the limb. Um, and I think that that spoke volumes mm -hmm. and um, did, um, I guess, wonders. I mean, I don't think that we were really looking to improve our, our school image, mm -hmm. but that's what actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, relationships relationships were being built. Mm -hmm. um, parents who had um, um, experienced trauma in school mm -hmm. were now coming because they, they could see what we were there for. Um, uh, now, 20, fast forward to, thank you, to uh, 20, 20, or 21, 22, we're now back in school full time, which was jarring for a lot of students, uh, which is why we appreciate the SEL being there um, to help students cope. Uh, our school to home liaison, which uh, was hired at the elementary school and one at the middle school and one at the high school, again, to keep those, keep building those relationships and letting parents and families know that we're still here. We know that this is not over, but when it is, we're still going to be here. Um, we um, are not or did not offer a virtual option um, publicly, but anyone who needed a virtual option for what, you know, ap being apprehensive about coming back to the school building, riding a bus, um, being around a large group of um, students, um, they our, our school district would offer virtual learning on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we didn't even have a whole lot of students even ask, or families even ask, because we were, our, our families knew that, I believe that families knew that we were all in. Um, transitional classrooms mm -hmm. was another uh, piece that we tried, we just, jump feet first, all in. We knew that something had to be done because of the um, uh, academic situation we were in when COVID first hit. Um, and so there was a transitional classroom, much in, much like, I don't know, like a junior first or a, a young fives kind of program, that kind of idea. We were accelerating learning for those students who needed just a little more time. Um, I was, the, I am the teacher mm -hmm. in, in the third grade transitional classroom, and I'm smiling so big because we had students grow and are now in fourth grade. They made their transition and they're being successful. And so that was um, one of the uh, one of the changes. And I don't, um, we're uh, actually looking at continuing because there are still some of those students. Um, who are coming up from second grade, who are coming up from first grade, that just need a little, just a little more time to grow. Just a little more time. Um, we, and so the no barriers, just possibilities. He would not forgive me if I did <laughs> not say that. And so our <laughs> superintendent's mantra, which he has like ingrained in all of us, is no barriers, just possibilities. And I hope that you heard mm -hmm through my dialogue mm -hmm. that um, there's no reason for any of us to um, be left behind. Any reason for any of us, teachers, parapros, ad admins, students, parents, for anybody to be left behind because there are, we're going to remove the barrier so that they're only 
um, possibility. So. And what's next? We're going to continue, like Leah was saying in her pre in her part, that we're going to continue to offer that no barriers, just possibilities mantra. And not just a mantra, but we're going to be there to help you. You don't have a, a Chromebook? Guess what? We're going to swoop in. We don't have a hotspot, so we can't. We're going to swoop mm -hmm. in and get you the hotspot. You don't have anything. Um, uh, you, you said that you don't have snacks at home. Look, we got we got snacks for you. So all, supporting our scholars academically and socially through the improvement and retention of what we're currently mm -hmm. doing. So those processes, the, the PLC work, the CLC work that we're constantly doing um, as, as a team, mm -hmm. as a building, as a district are going to... Um, ensure success for all of our learners, not just the lowest ones, not just the sped ones, not just the higher one. Everybody is going, we can only be successful um, when we're all successful. We're not leaving anybody behind. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue um, with that creative communication between school and home. So um, I can't get you on the phone. Somebody is probably going to show up at your door. Um, <laughs> if I can't get you on Dojo, you can probably uh, count on a text from, um, and not just me, that's a community, a school community um, initiative. The, if we have friends, uh, teachers who don't want to use their personal stuff, they're, they're, again, no barriers, just possibility. There are ways around, and we're going to get to you and make sure that you're <clears throat> successful. And I think the pandemic showed that with regardless of where you're working Where? suburban, urban, rural, a combination of all of those that teachers, buildings use the resources they have, wanting to make sure that all kids are seen, heard, helped, and that families are supported as well. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the beautiful things out of all the hard that's come out of the pandemic is the ways that uh, schools have figured out other ways and other possibilities of reaching and connecting mm -hmm. with families in ways that we never would have thought possible before that. Mm -hmm. And so those are definitely things I know that we all hope that will continue to carry and flourish yeah. as we go on. So thank you so much, Shildora. Mm -hmm. With that, I just have a few little shares of uh, MToy update of some things that have been going on with me the last few weeks. I've had a lot of very exciting things just happen in the last couple of days, which I really want to talk about, but I'm going to save those for May because um, just I, my schedule's been packed now that we're finally a little bit over the hump of Omicron. So um, I visited Beth Funk at Washtenaw International Middle Academy for a day. Um, I got to sit in on her classrooms. Uh, I just wanted to be a student in her room. She has, this is a blanket she has uh, crocheted. She has crocheted an insane number of blankets. She has pillows, all these things she's made for her students for their reading time. I got to sit in on both of her sixth grade uh, class and uh, her eighth grade class where she was introducing the book Night by Illy Weissel and got to um, experience that 90 minute course with her. And let me tell you, um, every eighth grader should get a 90 minute course on an introduction of that book with Mrs. Monk, who is sadly retiring at the end of the year. Um, it was just an incredible day um, of watching a master educator um, connect kids to the love of learning and infusing it um, within history. So then I got to spend a day at Mildred C. Wells Academy um, in Benton Harbor. And I'm going to just tell you right now, I'm going to get emotional. This was hands down the best day I've had out in a school this year. I had an incredible day in this building. Um, it, the building exudes joy, creativity. Um, teachers in that building, several of them are on emergency um, certifications. They are not um, for the next couple of years, but the work and the care that that staff has in that building was inspirational. I got to go into a first grade classroom and read to a class, and I talked to them a little bit about how books entwine in your heart. And you know how I feel about books, so. Um, and I was talking to them about the book I was choosing to read, and I asked them, I said, do you have a book that entwines in your heart? And I'm not kidding, the entire class got up we're pulling books out of the back of their chair pockets. We're hugging them. We're holding them up. We're calling out the characters they love. Mm. It was a beautiful day. Um, mm. and you want to see joy in a building, you should go visit that school. <clears throat> Take a minute. <clears throat> hmm. 
All right, then I got a chance the following week to go to Walt Whitman Elementary in Pontiac. I had an, a wonderfully amazing day there as well. I got to spend time in several different classrooms, one of which was um, a fourth grade classroom where they were learning about um, early pre-revolutionary history and I got to speak to kids and they were making comparisons to George Washington and um, King uh, George. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, blown away. I was like, okay, I need to sit in this class because clearly I don't have a very good understanding of this point in history. Those kids were having incredible dialogues in, in that experience. And I also got to sit in um, with the uh, superintendent and in their partnership meeting with the state, which was um, incredible to hear about the innovative ways they are working to support kids in that district. And then I think this might be my last one. Um, I got to visit uh, Mr. James Johnson um, at Lock Loy Norix High School for the day. He, he was here with me in February. I got to see all the rich teaching practices he spoke about here in action. He was doing a whole, um, he was working his AP his US history class through like a very fast paced uh, comprehensive lesson about Vietnam War and I was, I continually to be am blown away by the educators in this state and watching him teach um, both his AP US history class and his US history courses and the way he connects with kids and helping to get them connected to their learning, help them see the value in it, have them see themselves in their learning and giving them the autonomy to be reflective in that work um, was truly inspirational. If every child had an experience in a history class like that, I can only imagine um, the trajectory in which we would continue to blossom and grow for learners. And that's it. I just went through a little yeah. whirlwind there. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teachers of the Year. Uh, board members, questions or comments for our uh, Teachers of the Year? I just always say. Please. I just always say thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's good to see uh, Saginaw County <laughs> in the building. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other other board members, anyone else? I, I want to say thank you both. I appreciate your passion. I, I saw you about to tear up. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I appreciate that you have the trauma <clears throat> focus, um, the ACEs, you know, mm -hmm. really this is so important because if you can, um, catch it early, deal with it early, you can change the course of their lives. So I appreciate that and I appreciate the 100% free lunches for the students here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Ms. Kelly, and I appreciate you mentioning ACEs, but lest anyone think that we're talking about CARD, could you translate <laughs> that acronym for us? <laughs> Just took it out of my mind. Adverse childhood experiences. So adverse childhood experiences. Right? <laughs> yes, I know, right? We're a little we bit older. Yeah. So, so adverse childhood experiences and, 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 and working to discern whether children have been mm -hmm. trauma affected mm -hmm. and then addressing that, that trauma so that they're able to learn or learn better. Definitely. You bet. Thank Definitely. you so much. I appreciate that. My Thank you. My sister's an MSW, so that's something okay. we, we talk about. There you go. Thank you. Other um, other reflections from board members? And other reflections from board members before I do mine? Uh, so 75% of Bridgeport Spalding children were um, were in person, in person. last year. Mm -hmm. Where were the other 25%? That's why we hired the uh, home to school liaison. That's why we uh, took to the street to figure out where they were. Right, because we a lot of times they're on our class list, and they've not shown up to a Zoom, and they've not called, they've not come and pick up a Chromebook, mm -hmm. they don't have a hotspot, numbers aren't working, so we have to know where they are. And some children in virtual programs. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. And, and some of them were, mm -hmm. but Dr. Rice, to be honest, a that other twenty-five percent, a large chunk, we couldn't find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So some children by parent choice were in virtual programs. Yes, sir. Right. And some children were, were hard to, to locate. Yes. In the pandemic. And continue to be hard to locate. Right. Understood. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned, um, Ms. Porter, that um, there's much greater rigor in third grade 
than than second grade. Mm -hmm. But and and so as an educator, I understand what you're talking about. But there are non-educators who mm -hmm. perhaps don't understand. Okay. So they might think that, that every year there's greater rigor. So what's the difference between second and third grade? So we really think of K-2 as like our primary grades, right? So it's like establishing those learning structures, building, uh, you know, like gains that are kind of grow over time. And so what happens is, is that after that K-2, it's kind of a shift where we look at grade bands. So then it kind of moves to a 3-5 grade band. And what that really means is that we're just kind of stepping up more of the academic focus of content as well. Mm -hmm. So not that you're not doing those science experiences and those social studies experiences at K2, but that's where that rigor kind of steps up there, mm -hmm. along with the fact that, and I, I hate saying this because I, I think that every teacher is a reading teacher, but mm -hmm. you know, if we were to look at it theoretically, K2 is where we're really mm -hmm. focusing in on the structures of reading. Mm -hmm. Third grade is where that we hope that that application of all those skills kind mm -hmm. of comes together. And so what we were finding, and I, I could speak for myself, but I'm probably speaking for every third grade teacher, is that, well, of course, we've had, would have kids that needed extra supports each year, mm -hmm. but we were just having such larger mm -hmm. amounts of need mm -hmm. because of the ways that we were, um, as much as we were trying to engage kids, we couldn't control all the different factors that we could when kids were sitting in front of us. And so just those needs were larger, greater, um, and wanting to balance, knowing that we we need to keep instructionally building that robust experience of learning in the classroom, but helping students navigate how to, I don't want to say survive, but survive those first few months, which right. is what Sheldora was speaking about a little bit with that transitionary third grade, that kids that had had an experience in third grade stayed for a little while longer with her to get more of that time. Mm -hmm. And so most structures of schools didn't have that. So it was how are we balancing kids to not build alert helplessness, to not feel like I can't navigate this this curriculum and see like we're here, we're going to continue to grow and helping to adapt some of those routines and structures for kids in the short term. And um, what we found is, is that many with time back in the classroom, having those structured routines, supports, encouragement, were able to make those major growths. Mm -hmm. You know, now still the question is, is those that aren't is it still because they still need more time or is it because we need to be looking potentially at, you know, specialized supports for them? Mm -hmm. That might have been longer than what you were hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you asked though, so, Dr. Rice. I had, no, <laughs> I had no hope particularly, but I had an expectation. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, but but uh, the thoroughness is what I would expect from, from Teachers of the Year, so I appreciate that. Ms. Haynes, you talked about... Um, that you were glad that SEL was there to help our kids cope. Um, tell me what you mean by that. So because a lot of our students, um, be, well, let me, let me back up. Because we're in the, I guess, geographic area that we're in, there's a lot of trauma already. Um, you can imagine absent parents, um, uh, not a, a strong, you need to go to school type mentality um, because there are other things on the table. There are other things on the table. There are more, I guess, in for that, for particular families, there are more important things that need to be taken care of outside of you need to go to school. And so when we're, I guess, for lack of a better term, herding them in, bringing them into the building, um, especially after not having a social interaction for almost two years for a lot of them, we have to learn how to play together all over again. Mm. We have to um, learn how to be kind. That, just a note, you mean that literally? Literally, mm -hmm. yes. literally, literally. How do we interact I'm, I'm, I'm with taking human? that, don't slap my hand, or don't take my stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we have to learn how um, to play together. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to talk to one another. We have to um, learn how to um, give an appropriate response. Or if your response is inappropriate, um, be able to take why it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, we have to learn how to um, be respectful in the restroom and be respectful in the hallway and be respectful in on the playground and in the cafeteria and with teachers that 
aren't yours all day. Guest teachers and um, related arts teachers and mm -hmm. um, the secretaries or administrative assistants in the office. And so we, had, we have to learn when we're still learning how to do that. And so SEL plays a huge part if students know who they are and how they're feeling. And so if I can tell you that, Ms. Haynes, I, I didn't have, I didn't go to sleep like I was supposed to last night, so I might be a little, so then I can show you some grace mm -hmm. when you just need to put your head down for a few minutes. Or Ms. Haynes, you know, you know, my mama had to work last night and she wasn't there to put us on the bus this morning. So we didn't get a chance. So maybe you need a little more time to eat your second breakfast. That kind. Of, and so SEL will give or helps our students um, find the words. Um, find or be able to go and find the space so they can cool out for just just a few or communicate, um, like I said before, find the words to let you know that I'm really not being disrespectful. I'm just a little tired. So just give me a minute. And we've all been there. Mm -hmm. And because we're adults, we, we know how to respond appropriate. Some of us do. We know how to respond. <laughs> we know how to respond. We're supposed to know how to respond appropriately. But these are students who have not had that chance for two years. And so why our learning has been and why Leah is asking the legislator, legislature to pause, learn, or pause a standardized testing, not forever, just for a little bit because we have all of these other layers that we're, de that we're all dealing with, not just she and I, but everybody in the school community are dealing with. Mm -hmm. We're not asking for a break. We're not asking that we don't get evaluated. We're not asking um, for you not, or for you to um, um, just leave us to our own devices and not um, us be uh, accountable for what we're doing. We just need a little grace, just like the students. Right. And help support their critical needs. Right. So, so you mentioned at least four of the five SEL competencies, um, a child's self-awareness, right? Um, awareness of others, sort of relationship to others in the sandbox, <laughs> self-management. Mm -hmm. You know, I was up late. Um, I didn't have help in the morning, may not have had breakfast in the morning. Uh, my self-management may be off. Um, I may not have had breakfast. Um, and, then, and then to the issue of relationship to others, which was a fourth of the five SEL competencies that you um, mentioned because of some of these other factors, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. SEL is pretty prosaic, isn't it? It's pretty ordinary on the one hand, pretty basic, mm -hmm. uh, but pretty foundational yeah. also. Um, grist for the relationship mill and the absence of it, it's hard to get a lot done academically if, if those, those norms, um, classroom norms, school norms aren't established. I appreciate you sharing that. Well, and its intentionality can be transformative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Pugh? Um, one of the things that, that, you know, I want us to one day be able to speak to more clearly when we talk about children who were out of school. They were out of school because we had yeah. a global pandemic, right. Mm -hmm. a Absolutely. global pandemic that killed people, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that sickened people, that um, left children orphaned, meaning that they lost a caregiver or, uh, or a parent. It still is. Um, and, and still is. And so that, when kids lose people, <laughs> that has an impact on Absolutely. their lives. Absolutely. And where we're from, Saginaw was one of the highest, uh, had the highest of the highest death and hospitalization rates, um, as well as illness rates. And people really have been sick, and we still do have the impacts of that illness, not only on older people, but on children. There's the data that, that shows that. So we cannot um, lose sight of that. We should also know 
that, um, you know, I worked with the Saginaw ISD when they were trying to get social emotional learning support um, way before uh, COVID happened, way before the Flint water crisis happened. We were trying to get school nurses. We were trying to get counselors. So to your point, you know, some of these things we've been begging for for a long time and COVID just put a spotlight on the need for, for, for these for these things. So um, loss um, as well as children, definitely we knew when we were unfortunately having to pull children out of school until we could figure out what this was, what right. was happening. Right. You know, Dr. Rice, you and I talked, you know, those of us who, who really looked at this, when this pandemic first started, we were telling people to wash their, their um, grocery bags before they brought them in the house. And then we would soon realize that it was airborne, you know, definitely um, have fo more focus on the fact that this was an airborne virus. So we had to learn, and then we had to learn about these mitigation tools that we had, and then we had to get them in hand. So, um, you know, unfortunately, yes, we knew that that was going to have a, a huge impact on our children. We know that in-person school and the, the what you all as, as teachers, nurturers of our children give to our children, um, but all of those things uh, before COVID and definitely during COVID and now we, we will have to be working on. So again, thank you all. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation and your leadership. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. Mr. Martin Ackley, director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs will lead the state and federal legislative uh, update. Uh, Mr. Ackley, welcome. Dr. Rice, um, due to conflicting schedules this month, the uh, <coughs> legislative committee meeting did not meet. It was uh, canceled. Uh, but I do have a brief report on the legislature. Um, they're back this week after a two-week break. Um, the House will be out the following week, next week for Passover, before, before returning the week after. So happy Passover to those who celebrate Passover, and happy Easter to those who celebrate Easter. A um, couple of bill packages of note that we expect to receive some attention soon. Um, one is a reciprocity package, um, Senate Bill 861 and Senate Bill 942. 861 addresses teacher reciprocity and Senate Bill 942 addresses school counselor reciprocity. Um, the department enthusiastically supports these bills and a letter was drafted earlier this month and sent to the Senate Committee on Education and Career Readiness affirming that and we expect these bills to be taken up in committee soon. There's also a uh, four bill Senate package um, on dyslexia uh, to identify students with dyslexia and give educators the training uh, to assist students with dyslexia. Um, that bill package has been reported out of committee and is on the floor now. There are some issues that the department is working with the sponsor and the um, Senate to try to uh, improve those bills. And the third issue is something that Dr. Rice mentioned in his uh, superintendent's report, and that's the teacher recruitment and retention budget recommendations. Uh, spring has sprung, and the legislature still has not moved on the important funding for crucial uh, teacher recruitment and retention initiatives. The governor has recommended $1.7 billion to support educator retention. Uh, given the urgency of the teacher shortage, MDE has called on the state legislature to approve the recruitment and retention recommendations prior to the beginning of spring uh, so local school districts can begin to sink these initiatives into the soil of their communities between now and the start of next school year, as Dr. Rice has said uh, many times. Um, and also it was reported today that the House and Senate uh, will soon move on their respective budget bills, uh, either this week or next week, and also uh, projected revenues for the state aid fund were reported uh, by the Senate Fiscal Agency to be $370 million above year-to-date projections. So that's more good news for the state aid fund. Uh, but like I said, spring has sprung and the clock is ticking and we continue to urge the legislature to expedite uh, that part of the state budget. Dr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. I yep. appreciate that. Uh, board members, any um, questions or Question. comments for Mr. Ackley? Please, Ms. Snyder. Can you expand on the dyslexia bills? What are what are the discussions around the issues with that bill in terms of quote unquote improving it? Um, some of the issues that the um, that are still with us, the way the the uh, bills read and interact right now, it's perceivable that an individual could be required to get training both in their prep program and then again when they're hired, 
Um, and then again, when they move to professional certification, so there's kind of a redundancy in the training um, that would be required as the bills are written now. And then uh, it would create definitions of dyslexia training and specialized reading literacy personnel. We're trying to um, work on that. And then um, new language about administrative roles may cause confusion between the differences between this and administrating, administering instructional programs used in the administrative certification laws. So just some technical things that we're trying to um, straighten out. So the redundancy is for general education teachers, yeah. and we want well, that. Or, I, the department doesn't want um, the redundancy for general education teachers. They want a certified yeah. dyslexia. And there is a, a bill, Senate Bill 383, uh, that would create an advisory committee within MDE to assist in developing or adopting and updating a dyslexia resource guide for special education too. So that's also so special education students are being. Um, included in this package. Okay, um, and then separate from that, uh, the assessment of, of a student that has dyslexia, um, much like uh, special education students can have outside um, assessments, if you will, is that something that's still possible? Uh, I have to get back with you on that. I know Senate Bill 380 uh, would require that by 2024 and 25, there are certain screenings of students of, with characteristics of dyslexia and follow-up supports and require the department to develop and provide technical assistance to districts on dyslexia and require educators to have certain trainings. Screenings, yeah. yeah. Just like special ed, because you can have the screenings done in class, but parents can also take students outside of class to yeah. uh, a psychologist, a developmental psychologist, and have a screening privately that they then would submit to the school district. So. Um, if you could ask further and inquire further if that's something parents are able to do within the dyslexic screening as okay. well. Outside screenings. Um, yeah. And then what would that look like? Uh, how, what would schools honor um, as a, an appropriate screening? Okay. Um, I think that's all for now. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Any other questions or comments from board members? Hearing and seeing none, um, just, just two notes. Um, Senate Bill 861, Senate Bill 942 on reciprocity for teachers and counselors, respectively. We've worked with those bill sponsors, uh, Senator McBroom and Senator McCann, uh, Republican and Democrat, respectively, on those uh, reciprocity bills. Uh, they are strong. They have bipartisan support. So we would hope that they would be passed. Um, we had hoped that they would have been passed by now. But uh, we would hope that they would be passed uh, very, very quickly. Um, they have precisely no cost um, or de minimis cost for the, for the state. We have had about 1,000 teachers a year in each of the last five years. Um, initially be certified outside of the state, subsequently within the state, 1,326 last year. 31% of all of our teachers that were certified last year were certified out of the state initially and then subsequently within the state. But we think that we can do better with some regulatory relief. And these two bills, again, sponsored by or, or introduced by Senator McBroom, Senator McCann, would, um, would, would do that. So thank you for raising those two important pieces. The other thing is you mentioned the $1.7 billion in the governor's budget for um, staff retention. I note also that she has $600 million in for teacher recruitment as, as well. And those are important initiatives, many of which, not all, but many of which were developed within the department. And we are strongly supportive of and have urged the legislature for a number of months to approve some version of those so that they can be be, as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Ackley, sunk into the soil of our uh, local school districts so that they can be less metaphorically, so that they can have an impact on uh, teacher supply next year. And so we don't relive this year, next year, what we've lived this year relative to teacher supply. So thank you for, for sharing uh, that. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lipton is, uh, our chairwoman is, uh, had to leave. Dr. Pritchett, do you have a NASB uh, report? Uh, no, I do not. Um, Dr. Pugh was able to attend the legislative conference that NASB had at the end of March, so she may have a report, but I do not. Very good. Dr. Pugh, do you have a legislative report? 
Thank you, Dr. Pritchett, for putting me on the spot there. <laughs> I, and it's okay if you don't. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, um, I don't. And, and it, it was a good conference. It was the first conference uh, probably in three years that, yeah. that people have all been together. It was my first in some years. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that stuck out to me is the term um, unfinished learning versus learning loss. Mm and a really great conversation. And we heard from teachers that were really adamant about any table that where education is being discussed, they need to be a part of that discussion. We had some great conversations around uh, parent uh, engagement and um, so, and, and also a good uh, meeting with the board for my first time being able to meet with them in person. So thank you, Judith. Sure. <laughs> That is my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. <laughs> Dr. Pritchett, comments by State Board of Education members. Comments by State Board members. I, I will say that I did have a, I, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, are, I'm sorry. No, it's all good. Are, are, <laughs> would you like to be recognized? Yes, can very I, good, Mr. Please. Chair? So um, I was just trying to get us out of here. So. Um, I did get have an opportunity to uh, speak last night at the um, Lake Michigan uh, um, College, uh, and thank you, uh, Superintendent Rice. We had an opportunity to talk before that meeting, and I thought it was a good meeting. I think, I think it was really good because we had an opportunity to hear from students, some who were facing student debt and some um, who were considering uh, taking on student debt. So just a really good conversation as well as uh, hearing from some of the policymakers. I do also want to speak to, you know, where, when we first began, and I wrote down some notes. I don't remember where I wrote them. But uh, just around the conversation around um, um, the terms when we talk about BIPOC communities, when we talk about the history of this country, when we talk about the fact that when we first, uh, when this first, when this country um, was first formed uh, that there were some who were considered less than human. And so I think that that's what we mean when we talk about white supremacy and the fact that there are people, and as, as board member Tiffany mentioned, um, yes, uh, African Americans who were brought over and were enslaved are definitely thought of, but there are others who, because the way that the systems were built, um, it just makes um, makes the, the, the system um, still less sub in need of perfection. And I think Dr. Rice has said it in so many ways far more elo eloquently than that. But um, I think that that's what we mean when we talk about uh, a white supremacy. Uh, white supremacy is not just people who are walking around with, with hoods on their ha heads, but we're talking about the systems that were built and how they were built and the fact that we continue to have to dismantle and do everything that we can to undo um, how the foundation that, that this country was built upon. And yes, we have made huge strides and many of us have overcome and we still, I don't think that there's any of us who would disagree that there's still work to do. And I think um, us blowing some of these terms um, making them more than what they are. I think that it gives us this opportunity to cause confusion and um, be mo more polarizing. So I, I mentioned last week that, or last month, that I hope that we do have someone who can, who can better break down that term, you know, some of these terms that we're talking about and be able to explain them so that we're not using them in, in the wrong way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other, uh, other board members, Ms. Snyder. I'll just respond uh, to a couple things and then I have a separate thing that relates to public comment that was made. Um, it is painful to have to continue to have this discussion, but at least <clears throat> we're having it and I, I will take that and within member comment, as opposed to being willing to be vulnerable enough to open ourselves up to say what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. Supremacy is supremacy. It does not know a race. And when we teach our kids that it does, when we support standards, initiatives, theories, 
uh, frameworks where all of this is baked into it, we are responsible for what those kids learn and what they think and feel when they go home about themselves. So no, there is no person on this earth that can unpack that term in a way that will ever make it acceptable. Supremacy is supremacy. It does not know race. And when we collectively come together and agree on that as a shared value, we'll be able to move forward. So I, I'll leave that there, and I will continue to show up as a broken record, because I think that is the foundation of moving forward. So in public comment, we had someone who, who said some things that were very uh, interesting. I had not heard that Rochester had had a, a, a lawsuit um, where information was collected on parents. Um, I had just been uh, informed that in Gross Point, a similar thing is happening here. This is a, um, I can't put it up on the screen or share it with anybody. I guess I could email it. Um, but it's a, an official letterhead, Gross Point letterhead with official people uh, who are currently serving in the school district. And this was handed out to students. Um, one student was willing to share this with their parents in a way that was uh, <clears throat> that caused some kind of alarm. But there were 15 questions on it, and I'll just I'll read off a few questions, and this is what they're asking the student, and then I'll tell you uh, what the the board of education and this the superintendent in that district had to say when when uh, it was brought up that this happened. So uh, one of the questions is, do you live with your parents? If no, with whom do you live? Explain why you do not live with your parents. Another question is, do you attend a church on a regular basis? If yes, write the name of the church. If no, explain why not. How many bedrooms are in the house in which you live? Has anyone in your family ever been accused or convicted of a crime? If yes, explain. Um, do the adults in your family regularly vote in elections? If yes, for which political party, Democrat, Republican, other, do they usually vote? If no, explain why they do not vote regularly. I mean, this is information that should never be asked of a student. So my understanding is after that, uh, and, and again, I, I don't, wouldn't mind investigating this as it, I, you know, if, if what is the truth behind this? What's the foundation of it? Um, it was said that students are learning about McCarthyism in US history class this week. Today, they were provided with a questionnaire which looked like an official document. Um, from administration, a student took a photo of this questionnaire, and as a result, it was shared on social media without any context. It is now spreading quickly and causing unnecessary confusion. Um, nothing about the document made it look as if it wasn't official. Uh, this has to be addressed just because there's a sense of um, if nothing about it doesn't make it look un unofficial, and then a school board or a school district can come back and say, oh, that we didn't really mean that. That that really is messing with the minds of kids in terms of what they can and sh should and should not expect to happen in school and what they should and should not. It, it, I'll leave that statement as, as is. Uh, students should be able to know that there are boundaries at school, right? And that we won't just play a game of it was not real type of thing. Um, that's a gaslighting that is not something we should be doing with students. Um, but again, I wouldn't even, you know, I see this and I think to myself, is this real? And yet we have people who are coming and saying, look in Rochester, there's a lawsuit and the school board settled and there's information they're collecting on parents uh, that came before the board and spoke in ways that they didn't want to have to deal with or hear. So um, I think this is a, a pretty big deal to investigate, ensure we know what's happening, uh, what our kids are being asked. If it's an exercise, I think it needs to be pretty darn clear it's an exercise. It's not an official, you know, we don't take something that is official and looks very official, pretend that, pretend that it's not. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McMillan. I appreciate um, Pam trying to walk back Tiffany's statement for her instead of letting Tiffany address it. Uh, but the fact is, is that uh, it's much more uh, than something that happened hundreds of years ago. Tiffany said that it was going on right now and that she was glad that Governor uh, Whitmer has that uh, link to the white supremacy and that it, that our children are being taught that one race is oppressors, the other is the oppressed. There's creation of division. It's 
Marxism always requires a struggle. Uh, there has to be a struggle in order to have revolution and uh, upheaval. Um, so, you know, this is just a part of that. Um, it's unfortunate. It's, it is a reason why teachers are leaving, why students and parents are pulling their kids from schools. And I just had hoped that we could have uh, at least uh, urged the governor to remove that reference, uh, which is why I put the uh, resolution forward. Um, so I, it, it's a nice try, um, but uh, when the mass drops, the truth comes out a lot of times. So we now know that it's not something that happened hundreds of years ago in their minds, that there are some that think that uh, this is a white supremacist society in, in Michigan, and, um, and certainly the kids are being taught that, unfortunately, and the governor appears to be fine with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I'll, hopefully I can talk here. My granddaughters have been sharing <clears throat> colds with me. I want to um, thank all the presenters today. Obviously, I, you know, anything that's got kids in it, I sort of float to. Thank you to our Teachers of the Year. I appreciate that you get into what you're dealing with on a daily basis, what you are teaching, and what you're not teaching. Um, and I know what school districts are focused on right now. Uh, they're getting towards the end of a year of recovery and looking forward to the fact that next year we won't have to deal, hopefully. Uh, we've all got our fingers crossed with some of the issues that we had to deal with in September of this year. But this week, they're dealing with um, PSATs, mm -hmm. M-steps, upheaval of schedules. Um, these are the banes of my existence because um, of all of the things we didn't need to be doing this spring, my opinion, we didn't need to be putting students, staff through this mm -hmm. again. But we are. Uh, they're being scheduled, and staff will rise to the occasion, and our children will rise to the occasion, and they will take the assessments. And all I can ask this body is that we look at the result, we put them aside where they belong, and we move forward. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I have no idea what those results are going to look like. I do know that uh, one of my granddaughters expressed concern that she might not be able to finish it mm -hmm. in the time allotted. And I assured her that that was okay. She didn't need to worry about that right now um, with everything else. As far as the discussion from this morning, the document that was referenced, and again, I am, um, my role or my background is that I still interact with some local school people. And that particular document was intended to be a blueprint for recovery for last summer. I'm not sure any of them know where the document is at this point, and I can't speak for every school district in Michigan, um, or whether they are referencing that particular section. They could be. I'm not saying they aren't whether they're referencing that particular section. As I just indicated to you, I do know what they're doing right now. They're looking forward to next month. They're hopefully going to have normal graduations. Their high school kids are going to have their normal proms. We need to support them in that. I have some strong views on the fact that this board is supposed to be here to support local school districts because that, in turn, then, supports our students. And so that's where I will come down. Uh, if it deals with something that a local school district has to deal with right now, then we need to deal with it. But I'm more focused on the fact that we need to support our districts and what they're going through in the next month, month and a half. And more importantly, or as importantly, look forward to next fall uh, in supporting them in any way we can, including trying to get some of these bills passed so that we've got reciprocity, uh, that we've got some funding to be able to have administrators say to teachers, 
we're able to retain you next year because I know I've got funding to be able to do that uh, for those teachers who may be right at the point of, I'm not sure I am going to stay for another year or another two years. If that can be a motivator for them, then I think that's what we need to focus on at this point. Again, my opinion. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing that. And of course, what we know is, is that our effort to get state summit of assessments waived last year, a uh, requirement um, from the U.S. Department of Education was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And if it was unsuccessful last year, it wasn't going to be successful this right. year um, mm -hmm. either. That was, that was pretty clear. So nothing that the state legislature can do can set aside the U.S. Department of Education ruling in that regard. We can uh, appeal to the um, state legislature all we want for that. Um, I might add, um, I think that the, the focus ought to be on academic and social and emotional learning. I've said that. I said it last year. I said it two years ago. Um, I don't believe that in this period of time we need state summative assessments. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, there was no opportunity for a waiver uh, mm -hmm. this year, as you right. well know. If there wasn't going to be a waiver last year, there wasn't going to be a waiver mm -hmm. uh, this year. I just want to make clear uh, that was never in play. Right given what, uh, what occurred uh, last year, with which I disagreed, obviously, because I signed the, uh, the waiver request to, to USDOE. Um, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Tilly, to you. Thank you. Um, first, let me say, now, um, every time I think about adverse childhood experiences, I was just thinking about <laughs> the aces on the card, the spades, uh, the ace of spades. <clears throat> but, um, also want to say representation matters, representation matters, representation matters. And I'm so proud that we have our first Supreme Court judge, um, Kentaji Brown Jackson. Um, to Tom's point, you know, we keep hearing every month, white supremacy does not exist. And uh, you just stated about it, not being something from we don't believe it was hundreds of years ago. Slavery ended. White supremacy did not end when slavery ended. Um, in fact, America created the biggest prison system in the world, um, which instead of now having slaves on the cotton fields, we had slaves in the prison system giving free labor. Um, and it, it exists in, in many different ways, many different facets. You still have the school to prison pipeline. You have the achievement gap. You have redlining. You have gentrification. You have uh, where African Americans get weighed differently when it comes to credit. You have the wage gap. Uh, and no, it didn't end hundreds of years ago. You just had the civil rights movement back in the 60s, 1960s. You have the Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act, Act of 1976. Uh, people are still finding deed restrictions that say uh, African Americans, Jews, different races cannot live in this community. So it, it definitely still exists. Thank God we have a governor. Thank God we have African Americans. Thank God we have other minorities in positions of power where we can speak out because our children are definitely affected. They've been affected throughout the ages in the classroom because you have teachers who, um, and, and in the African American community, I know I can attest that I've been told and I've heard of others being taught when they were in the classroom by white teachers if they wanted to, you know, I'm, my grandfather said that he wanted to play an instrument. His teacher told him he couldn't, he wasn't smart enough to play an instrument. Um, you have different incidents of where people wanted to go into careers or grow up to be something and their white teacher told them that they could not. Uh, but, I, but they didn't give that same treatment to the white children. So there are plenty of examples, plenty of disparities that have existed in the 1900s and still exist today, way beyond slavery. Um, 
somebody spoke about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, representation matters. We need other voices at the table. For so long, we have had white men lead this country and say what matters for everybody. You cannot know what matters for everybody. That's like me going, and, and even the fact of you denying these things. It's like me saying, uh, a farmer is complaining, and I'm saying, oh, no, that can't happen with the horses on your farm, or no, that can't happen with your pigs. I'm not a farmer. I can't read a few articles or watch Fox News and know what goes on on somebody's farm, and now I'm an expert. No, I have to be open and empathetic to the needs of what's going on, to, on, on that person's farm. I'm not walking in their shoes. And as a black person, as an African-American woman in this society, you cannot tell me, and you do not even have the right to tell me. You can voice your opinion all, all day, but you really do not have the right to tell me how it feels to be African-American or what I go through or what any other African-American in this society goes through. And let's also be clear, what one African-American goes through doesn't mean that all African-Americans have experienced that. So. You, you, you have to listen to other people. Ms. Haynes made a very good point when she did the Teacher of the Year report, and she said, we can only be successful when we are all successful. Mm -hmm. So if you continue to, to try to push back and say that supremacy doesn't exist, racism doesn't exist, people aren't going through these things, you are denying people the right to be successful. You are denying our children in Michigan the right to be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tilly. Um, Ms., uh, Ms. Porter, and then uh, one, one, uh, uh, one touch base with Mr. Strayhorn because he's the only one who hasn't had a bite of the apple. Ms. Porter. Um, Ms. Tilly, I just wanted to go back to what you said about representation matters and thinking so much about the work, the long road ahead that we have in education to build a system of equity for students. And you know, as you were speaking, I, I was just thinking of these layers, right? All these layers that we are working so hard to strive for. One is the criticality of building a more diverse teaching staff in the state. So kids have experiences with teachers that look like them. Um, that is critical for all students to have that opportunity. Um, it is also essential that as teachers, we are building experiences um, and using books that are reflective of the students in our classrooms along with the world around them. And I, that is a journey that we are growing and pushing and advocating. I know I am as a teacher is in both my district and at the state level, but it is critical to make sure that we are providing diverse resources in our classroom so kids see themselves reflected in the text that they're reading. And you know, as you were speaking, and I appreciate your passion so much, I, I think for myself is that this equity work that we are doing right now at its foundation is the journey of elevating all learners and looking reflectively at our systems. And we can't do that if we're all not owning the fact that we need to do that work. And that we are, in order to do that, we can then ensure that each child is given the tools and environment to thrive. And um, I just appreciate your passion and know that I am right there with you, speaking as loud as I can, to know that it is so critical to give each child the chance to elevate, to be their best selves, and that comes from being intentional about the systems we're providing in classrooms. So I just wanted to say thank you for that and just wanted to share my thoughts on that as well. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Uh, <coughs> Kelly, uh, Mr. Strayhorn, uh, yeah. you get the unenviable task of trying to follow. Your <laughs> <laughs> um, fellow board members in that regard. Okay, well. Yeah, I'd like to say that, you know, it was a great presentation today. Obviously, the ones that, you know, with the two teachers of the year, that was outstanding, what you were able to portray up there and, and show. Uh, you brought up, I think it was Buena Vista County, yeah, that, that township, that, that school district. Yeah, I've been there before. You know, I understand, like, that. this is the area, Saginaw County, your, your stomping grounds. Yeah, that's a rough area, real rough. You know, those are some places that, that, Unless you've been, you really don't understand. You talk about the trauma and how to help those children through that. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, being able to consolidate it. You know, a good friend of mine was Charles Rogers, who was a Saginaw kid. We know his, you know, I don't know if you guys know about him. The guy was a great athlete who, you know, rose to prominence and ended up passing away before the age of 40, you know, because of the environment, the things that he was exposed to as a youngster. You know, I've had the option, you know, the I guess it, it would be um, the honor to be uh, in front of a lot of people and be in a lot of places, a lot of different demographics from places like that to some very, very affluent, well-affluent places. Places like Orange County, places that you know, I actually have a home in right now, you know, places like that, places here in Michigan that are really rough, places out in the farm, places out in Dexter. I've been all over the place. And, and there's not a deficiency in that. It's just a difference in the places that, you know, people, are, their surroundings are what they are. And I recognize that. To act as if there is no difference, that everybody is the same, I, I, thought, I thought that's something I only saw on TV that was a joke. You got to be freaking kidding me to sit here and say <laughs> that there's no difference from people that are born in in certain areas versus other like affluent areas, non-affluent areas, you know, pro, you know, in neighborhoods where there's violence and homes where there's two parent households and everybody's college educated. It's, it's totally different. And until we do understand that inequity, then we won't we won't be successful. As you know, board member Tilly said. We have to understand each, the differences between each other in order to move forward. We can't ignore it. You know, y'all know you want to be a broken record every week and every month. We talk about that. You say this stuff, Tim, Tim, Tom, about, you know, what white supremacy is or it doesn't exist. It does absolutely exist. It absolutely does. And that's no knock against all white people. Not at all. All white people are white supremacists. (laughs) But a system, like you said, is trying to be unwound from hundreds of years of how it's been set up. You know, slavery. You talk about the prison systems. I mean, it's a real thing. And and, and for for me to sit by here and, and just continue to just be silent on it, it is rough. You know, I try to be a team player. I want to try to bring people to the middle and let's, let's get to a common ground. But some of that extreme talk's got to stop. It really does. Let's just be... You know, we got to understand one another. We do. We got to understand one another. Have apathy for your brother, your neighbor. That's that's what. I don't care what religion or non-religion you are. That's just the right thing to do, in my opinion. So, you know, again, thank you for your presentation. You know, thank everybody for being cordial. Uh, but that is it. That's the benediction right there for you, Dr. Rice. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but Dr. Rice. Oh, oh no, no, Pam. You know what? No, no, no. Hold on, pa- pa- pastor, 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 provide the benediction. But no, no, no. You no. want to tell us about next Sunday service? <laughs> no, I can't even have a comeback. But I, you know, I, if if I may, I'm not. Uh, my name was mentioned in a sound bite. Uh, and other and, and others and others were as well. We, yeah, we but there get, was we misinformation get, that was there, put there, out there. there Dr. And you know Wright. what? There is there is misformation frequently at this table. I do not condone that. But we need to be able to reply if, to if it. If we if we waited until if we if we waited until all the misinformation were over. But uh, but he put words in my mouth. He said that that and the I same said was something that, to me, that I said. So I'd like that opportunity as well. I hope you, she does. You know what? If the if the uh, if the board would uh, would so choose, we'll do it. Okay. There you go. Please. I'm tired of this being uh, the the playground that you use for your di- for the divisive tactics. I'm tired of that, and I just wanted to be known that the sound bites that went out stated something that was inaccurate. I am in total support of what Tiffany said, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay. And then thank, I, you, thank you and very then much. I, Please. I certainly do, did not say you know I, words were put into my mouth in misrepresentations. I certainly didn't say there's no racism. Of course, there's racism. But this idea that we should be telling second graders who are Caucasian that they are oppressors and that, uh, you know, that uh, African-American second graders are oppressed and that uh, they're, you know, that their parents are oppressors and oppressed and part of this white supremacy society is something that is not, that is extremely harmful. Um, And I just can't believe that it would be supported by the majority of this board, uh, whether it's second graders, eighth graders, or 10th graders, this kind of 
divisiveness is what i'm talking about and you know to suggest that i don't think there's racism is so outrageous it's totally you know putting words in my mouth and misrepresenting obfuscating the the fact is is that there are some i think there's it's limited i think we have a great white supremacist society and that they want to keep telling little kids that and telling them that they're either a part of it or that they are victims of it and just sowing division and sowing uh you know instead of trying to have peace and harmony it's about division and about rising up and you know it's just it's uh it's unfortunate it's something that i won't just sit by and and uh, let happen without trying to stop it uh it you know it's why parents are turning from the public schools because this crt and this uh, stuff they we are all saying that there's there is racism nobody's point, saying there isn't point but point the point idea point. that this is a white supremacist society is just outrageous and it has to stop that we are going to be conveying this to kids and it just it's it's not something i'm going to sit by okay very good i'm sorry please he, point he, he just reiterated what he's he said for the past year. I was correcting the fact that he mentioned that I said something was correcting Tiffany, and that is not what I was doing. And so that's the point that I was making. Um, he just took a whole nother 20 minutes to um, express something that he's been stating. So I, I just, I, again, I'm, I'm tired of it. We had to wait a whole 40 minutes for the meeting to start because of it, and here we are again. And so thank you. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Maggie. I'm just going to reiterate as well. I just, it, it's going to continue to happen. The conversation is going to continue to happen to the same extent that you feel like you, nobody has a right to, to tell you what you go through. I feel just empowered to say the same thing on behalf of kids who are being taught that we live in a white supremacy society. We do not have a right to sit here and not understand what they are going through when they're being taught that. If we believe that it's not a blanket statement, then don't teach that teach what supremacy is, teach the history, just as we've talked about it. I'm not opposed to any of it. I don't not think that racism doesn't exist. I think that's what he was trying to correct. Right. I think yeah. over and over and over again, when we understand and we all accept that supremacy exists, we understand it does not know race is going to be a broken record because that's what kids need to be taught. They need to be taught that when they see it, no matter who they see it coming from, it's not right. It isn't okay. That's what they need to be taught. Not that it knows one race. Thank you. Thank you. So when I asked in a prior meeting, where was this being taught at? Um, we were told it, it was taught in Novi in a classroom or something. I don't think there's a widespread issue um, of people being taught or children being taught that they were oppressors. If anything, for years, African Americans have been taught that they were slaves. In order to have slaves, you have to have oppressors. Um, that's just logical. Um, it is what it is. And it's not even these, having these conversations, like Jason has a diverse background, I have a diverse background. I lived in a mixed neighborhood, have lived in mixed neighborhoods on and off my whole life, have went to mixed schools, went to private school, uh, have a very mixed family. I have European roots just like I have African roots. So it's not saying that, you know, everybody's racist or anything like that, but it's it's documented it's common knowledge for most people i live in america and in america unfortunately we live in a white supremacist society you cannot say that african americans have enslaved whites you cannot say that native americans have enslaved whites whites have ooh, enslaved african americans um African Americans, Native Americans, Chinese, Mexicans, Irish have all have all felt the effect of white supremacy in this nation. And this nation has been led by whites. 
the, the whites were the majority for a long time. We're just closing the gap where minorities are <laughs> are gaining on whites. But whites have been in control. Whites have been in, in power. So that is how you get white supremacy. Whites are the ones that came up with the laws, the policies, the constructs that have affected minorities. And we cannot break those barriers fully. We cannot destroy those constructs so that everyone can be successful until we acknowledge it and deal with it and change those policies and laws. And that's why we are shedding light on it. That's why the governor is shedding light on it. It's not about making you feel bad. If you feel bad about it, or whoever feels bad about it, that is something internal. But it, it's not about making, because that's not, we're, we're not oppressors, we're white supremacy. I mean, you look confused. I don't know what you're thinking, but it's not a point of making you feel bad about it. It's a point of, giving other people equality in this country that deserve it. And you cannot sit there with smoke screens if, if we're going to change things for everybody so that everybody has a good life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other board members want to say any other things? No, I'm talking. Okay. <laughs> very, uh, very good. Um, just. Uh, just uh, 120 seconds, not, not that I'm going to be a preacher, but I, maybe just a, a smidge of teacher. Um, slavery ends officially in the country with the 13th Amendment, not with the Emancipation Proclamation, not with the end of the Civil War, but with the 13th Amendment. But with the 13th Amendment does not come citizenship for blacks. That doesn't come until the 14th Amendment, three years later in 1868. And with citizenship, uh, and the 14th Amendment doesn't come uh, the right to vote, that doesn't come until 1817 with the 15th Amendment. Notwithstanding the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870, it's necessary to have the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 95 years later, for blacks to vote in the Deep South in this country. Where was the right of blacks to vote short of Reconstruction in the brief period post-Reconstruction in this country. It was buried under, it was subsumed, it was taken from them. How did that take place? What system permitted that? It took 95 years after the ratification of a constitutional amendment for blacks to vote again in the Deep South. They voted during Reconstruction for a brief period of time, and then they didn't vote again for almost 100 years. What system took away rights enshrined in the Constitution that were specifically for that group of people who had been without those rights previously? Voting Rights Act of 1965 passes in 1965, and yet in the 21st century, we're still fighting over voting rights. What system permits the perpetuation of those struggles over and over and over again? Future meeting dates, Tuesday, May 10th, Tuesday, May 17th, Tuesday, June 14th, the first a facilitated, a facilitated work session. The second two regular meeting dates at uh, 9.30, each of those. If there are any topics board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify Marilyn Mertz Snyder or me. It is 3.46. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>